Hey everyone, Disappointed Giant here. Welcome to the third video of my four part Dead Cells tutorial series. This video will focus on the mid to late game difficulties of 2BC, 3BC, and 4BC. There's a lot to talk about here, and I'm genuinely super stoked to jump into this with you. In my experience, I felt a noticeable bump and challenge when going to higher difficulties, specifically 2BC and 4BC, so I'm going to do my best to arm you with some tips and gameplay strategies to rightfully turn the tables back in your favor. This video will be broken up into four main parts, one for each difficulty level, and a fourth that talks about miscellaneous optimization tips and other random pieces of advice. There are timestamps in the description for each section in case you'd like to skip around. We have a lot to cover here, including some random strategies that are pretty specific, so let's get things moving. The first thing I want to do is give a quick refresher on where I personally like to be with my game progression before making my way up to 2BC. I cover all of this in my 0BC and 1BC tutorial videos, so I recommend checking those out if you haven't yet since this video builds on the concepts I introduced in those videos. I created a playlist for my tutorial videos which I'll link in the description. Here's a quick rundown of some of the more important things I've discussed. Unlock all of the general meta upgrades at the very top of the collector's list, like health flasks and recycling, while also unlocking restock and finding the merchandise categories blueprint in the graveyard. Collect all of the permanent runes and movement upgrades, including the Explorer's Rune from the end of the Forgotten Sepulchre, so you can reach all of the various paths and areas in each biome. Get the Disengagement Blueprint from the beginning of the Prisoner's Quarters and the Gastronomy Blueprint from Conjunctivius, so they'll both be available if you're looking for some extra insurance or if you start to feel a run go south. And finally, max out the plus gauge on the Legendary Forge by investing 500 cells and have at least a small chunk of cells invested into the plus plus quality gauge. As a side note, I recently posted a short cell grinding video that has a few tips on getting extra cells a bit more quickly than usual, so check that out if you're looking for some guidance on how to get the cell grind going. For another perspective, there's a great comment on that video from Esteban Shu where they mention using custom mode to make everything legendary so you can fly through the game with some OP items to get cells quickly. This is a super fun way of playing the game, but it does lock achievements, so if you decide to enjoy that method, I recommend doing it on a difficulty you've already completed. However you slice it though, getting a ton of cells is unfortunately a big part of building up your arsenal for higher difficulties, since the Legendary Forge takes a total of 13,500 cells to max out. Yes, you heard me right. 13,000. So now that we have some of the business side of things out of the way, let's tackle these difficulties in order. First up is a chunky one, 2BC. When you beat the Hand of the King on 1 BC, you'll get the second boss cell and will also get a blueprint for the recycling tubes. This great upgrade will allow you to choose from four random builds at the beginning of each run, regardless of what difficulty you play on. Each tube will have five items in it. One melee weapon, one ranged weapon, one shield, and two skills. The colors of these items are all random, so you may luck out with a lot of items of one color, or you may not. My main piece of advice for the tubes, besides unlocking it as soon as possible, is that if you don't see something you like, you really shouldn't restart the run to try to get a better starting build. The equipment in the tubes are all of the lowest possible item quality, so they should end up being replaced pretty early in your runs anyway. The prisoner's quarters always has free items lying around the level and has both a shop and a treasure chest, so hopefully you'll see something you can swap into your build as your runs get going. One of the things I focused on in my 0BC video was to try everything and to get comfortable with different items and build types. If you've been doing that, then your experience will pay off even more at the beginning of a run since you'll have more reps with some of the random items that may show up in the tubes. I'm sure you'll have a handful of other things and outfits to unlock by now, but the recycling tubes should be your number one priority as soon as you get them. So let's talk about the specific changes when moving up from 1BC to 2BC. First and foremost, the game is just straight up harder. Enemies have more health and do more damage, so you'll notice pretty quickly that your weapons may not be as effective and the hits you take hurt even more. While the enemy tier levels increase on 2BC, your item levels don't, which is a big part of why I think it's really important to beef up the forge to increase the default quality of your items. Adding insult to literal injury, all of the health fountains are broken and have been replaced with a single health flask after each level. If you don't need the flash charge, you can sell it for 3,000 gold, which is a nice chunk of change, but this also means that there are no more full refills from this point forward. 
Since healing becomes more of a commodity in 2BC, now's a great time to start purposely routing your runs if you haven't been doing that yet. In my opinion, there are two main ways to route your runs, but the one I'll focus on right now is knowing which biomes have food shops and purposely swinging your routes in the direction of one or more of these biomes if you need to. None of the second level biomes like the promenade or the sewers will have food shops, but most of the third level biomes do. The Ossuary, Ramparts, Morass of the Banished from the Bad Seed DLC, and Dracula's Castle from the Return to Castlevania DLC all come before the first boss and will have a guaranteed food merchant at 2BC or higher. If you're playing between 0 and 4 BC, food shops always sell small food for 2,000 gold, large food for 4,000, and flask charges for 20,000. The bank also has a food shop. This optional level will randomly show up once every run in the place of a non-boss, non-Castlevania biome. Taking the bank to get the food shop might be helpful as long as the gold gorgers don't pound you into dust first. You can also find food shops after the first boss if you either go to the Stilt Village, the Graveyard on 2BC or higher, or Fractured Shrines from the Fatal Falls DLC. Since we know small food restores 15% of your health and large restores 50%, for 6,000 gold you can get back 65% of your health. Visiting a food shop and buying the food is a bargain. Don't forget that if you use gastronomy, the healing power of food increases, so you'll either get 25% restored from small food or 83% from large. Getting an almost full heal from large food for 4,000 bucks is quite the deal. If you have the cash for it and need the extra flask charges, you can make the bigger investment for an extra flask at 20,000 gold. Just make sure you don't buy a flask if you're leaving the level with three flasks since you'll get one back in the transition area between levels. On the brighter side of things, 2BC multiplies the amount of cells that drop by two. Pair this with an incentivized biome and the cells will really start to add up. Double cell drops are great because even though the game gets more challenging, you'll potentially have more resources on hand to unlock more items from the collector and put more cells into the forge. In my 1BC video, I hinted that I would recommend dropping 1500 cells into the forge to get plus plus quality drops up to 50% before going into 2BC. While I still personally feel that way, I'm realizing that at this point it may just be better and more accessible for folks to say that the amount of cells you should put into the forge is subjective and up to you. I will always, always advocate for investing more cells into the forge than you think you may need since that will set you up for more consistent item quality in future runs. If you don't want to grind or spend that many cells while you're getting your 2BC momentum going, then that's totally your prerogative. If you have the advanced forge blueprint from your 6 conjunctivious kill, you can get away with being able to upgrade your items at the minor forge twice. This means that any plus quality item can be reforged through plus plus quality all the way up to S quality. However, that comes with the weight of knowing that you may need to spend a chunk of your gold on each weapon you want to upgrade, and that gold may be better used on either items or in food shops. You can either save up cells to invest into the forge for the delayed gratification of smoother runs in the future, or you can put your cells towards other blueprints which may possibly unlock items better suited to your playstyle, but you'll need to spend more of your gold to make weapons in your current run stronger. So whatever works best for you is the path I advise you to take at this point. Alright, so I promise I will leave you alone and I won't talk about the forge again until my 5BC video, but I will say that the less cells you spend now, the more you'll have to spend later since filling up the S rank gauge is critically important at higher difficulty levels. Speaking of important and necessary game mechanics, if you haven't been taking curse chests or routing through the two optional biomes in your runs, you should start doing that now. In my 1BC video, I mentioned that I think curses are optional in both 0 and 1BC. I still feel this way, but some folks had some compelling counterpoints saying that you should start taking curses and the detours through the prison depths or corrupted prisons as soon as you can. You can do this right after you get the spider rune. Whether you're already a cursed chest crusher or if you've never opened one before, starting at 2BC the extra scrolls from these cursed chests become incredibly important. That extra 15% multiplicative damage is going to help put a bigger dent in enemy health bars as your runs go on. You'll notice this as you invest scrolls into your primary stat since the bonus percentage number will get higher in bigger relative leaps with each scroll. There's a reason why the curse chest mechanic has such a high risk, high reward, and this is because you'll need as many on-color scrolls as possible. There are some levels where there's a 100% chance of spawning a curse chest, like the ossuary in the bank. So if you see these, you'll need to grab them now. 
Get into the habit of getting excited when you roll an extra curse in the Forgotten Sepulchre, and save your birthday wishes for getting double curses in the Slumbering Sanctuary. No matter where you're going in your route, the prison depths and corrupted prison should go from being an optional detour to a necessary part of your main path in all of your runs. My method of trying to prevent unexpected curse deaths is by peeking ahead to see what enemies and traps are waiting before opening the chest. I literally cannot count how many times I've rushed to take a curse only to be met by an elite right around the corner. It's better to have a plan and to know what ground you'll be covering before opening the chest because you can't put the curse back in. You can and should go through the door in the side biomes without taking the curse to see what's down the hallway. If the level generation doesn't climb up or drop down, then there's likely an enemy waiting for you right off screen. In the prison depths, these enemies can be hidden behind smoke from a nearby masker, or in the corrupted prison, they might be shielded by a protector. See, the game makes you think that you can't go back into the curse room if you open the door, but that's not actually true. You can climb up the very top of the wall and double jump into a roll to get both in and out of the tiny hole near the ceiling. This allows you to scope out the level ahead before committing to the curse. Also, if you're feeling weary or have a rare blueprint with you when you see a curse in a level that's not before a boss, you can always clear the level and then open the curse chest before going to the next biome. You'll take the curse with you into the next level. Sometimes it's worth doing this if you're noticing that the traps and fractured shrines or the rats in the graveyard are ending your runs prematurely when you're cursed. If you need to tweak the timing of when you take a curse, then you should do whatever you need to to ensure that you don't skip any of these chests when they come up. On that note, when you take a curse in a level before a boss, you should make sure that you have enough enemies left on the map to clear it. There's nothing like the dread of scanning the map for enemies while you're cursed and then realizing the level's empty and you have to go fight Mama Tick with the fire build. A good way to ensure this doesn't happen is by running past at least 10 non-teleporting enemies throughout the level so when you do find the curse, you know you'll have enough left to clear before fighting the boss. And since sometimes you'll find two curses in a level, it's good to plan ahead. Some folks say that you should add the next boss cell as soon as you unlock it since that will help you learn the ropes at that difficulty level and so you can get used to the added challenge. I totally understand that perspective and see that it has its merits, but personally, I recommend staying on the difficulty level you're at until you can repeatedly clear it without just scraping by and are able to throw a decent amount of cells into the forge. Alright, so I promise I will leave you alone and I won't talk about the forge again until my 5 DC video. I'm sorry, I had to mention that because it's a part of the thing I'm saying. Anyway, by spending some more time on your current BC before moving up to the next one, you may avoid hitting as big of a wall when the difficulty ramps up. Over the years, I've seen a bunch of folks have struggles getting through 2 BC and then they'll hit 3 BC and beat it in one or two runs. From there, they go right to 4 BC and end up having issues just making it out of the prisoner's quarters. Like most of what I suggest in my videos, this is just my subjective opinion on things, but I think holding off on jumping up to the next boss cell for another several runs could make the difference between you having smoother wins or feeling like you're back at the bottom of the barrel trying to fight your way out. One of the ways that you can make 2BC or any boss cell more manageable is by focusing on your weapon affixes for synergy. You'll notice that some of your weapons might have color-coded words on them that denote either a status effect, like makes the enemy bleed, or a damage bonus like plus 80% to a poison target. When you have one item that creates a status effect and another one that benefits from that status effect, you have synergy between the two items. The more of these that you stack at once, the higher your damage output will be. I'm going to dust off some of the concepts from my face flash video to give a couple of examples on how damage bonuses are calculated, but this time my math will be 100% accurate. So let's try this again. Take two. So for this explanation, let's pretend that you have a sword that does 100 points of damage with each hit. If you have an enemy that's afflicted with the bleed status and that sword has a plus 60% damage to a bleeding target affix, it will do 160 points of damage instead of its usual 100, which is a nice bonus. If that enemy is both bleeding and poisoned, and the sword that you're using has both the plus 60% to bleeding and plus 80% to poison affixes, the total damage per hit will be 240. 100 base damage from the sword, and then an additional 60 from the bleed bonus, and another 80 from the poison bonus. Bonus damage like this in Dead Cells is additive, so the percentages are added up to calculate the total damage from both the weapon's base value and any bonus values. This is a really important thing to focus on as you get deeper into the game because more damage means quicker kills which can mean more successful runs. 
All status effects are color coded in the item affixes, and if you have any synergies, you'll see a little exclamation point next to those particular affixes. You can also use things like the Tainted Flask Mutation or the Corrupted Power Skill to add even more bonus damage to your attacks, which will add on top of any other damage bonuses you have. And then, of course, you could pair the legitimately overpowered Face Flask with the Almighty Vengeance Mutation to take your build to another level, even if it's off-color. My Face Flask video is the first actual video I uploaded to YouTube, so it's a bit rough around the edges, and my explanation of damage calculation was completely and confidently incorrect, but the later chapters may be worth watching to at least get some more ideas on how to pump up your damage. I'll put a link to it in the description. So now that we've talked about 2 BC, let's get into 3 BC. The way I like to describe it is that it's more like a 2 BC plus than a completely new difficulty. This is just from my own personal experience and from reading other folks' accounts of their own progression, but 3BC may feel a little bit more evened out to you than 2BC did at first. Part of this is because your default gear level finally goes up a level and items from Curse Chests are S quality by default. Also, most levels in 3BC contain new power-up items called Scroll Fragments. If you collect 4 Scroll Fragments, you'll get an extra scroll, which is a nice way to keep beefing up your stats. On the other side of this though, most of the health fountains are completely broken in 3 BC. You'll only get two total flash charges, one after the first boss and one before the second. Ouch. You'll find a third charge if you have the Queen in the C DLC and take the Servant's Route at the end of the game. Earlier in the video I mentioned routing for food, which is still a great tool to have in your arsenal, but you may also want to start considering routing for scrolls. The Dead Cells wiki has a wonderful biome map that someone named Connor Sore created and I found it to be invaluable. This map shows the amount of scrolls and scroll fragments on every level so you can plan out your routes that way. When looking at each biome on the map, you'll see a handful of different pieces of information and icons. At the bottom of the section, you'll see a scroll of power and a dual stat scroll. This shows the number of each type of scroll that will be in that level by default, no matter what BC you're playing on. To the right of that is a curse chest icon with a percentage which tells you what your odds are for finding a curse. If something says 100%, that means that the level always has a curse. If it says 110%, that means it will always have a curse and has an additional 10% chance of spawning a second curse. The rightmost Roman numeral shows the default gear level of the biome that will show up in chests, drops, and shops. The picture of the biome may also have tiny icons in the corner showing if there's a food shop in the level at any difficulty, which as of version 3.4 are the Still Village, the Bank, and Fractured Shrines from the Fatal Falls DLC. On the left hand side you'll see icons for boss cells, and next to those it will tell you what additional content is added to the level on that respective difficulty. For example, in the ossuary, 1BC adds a food shop, 2BC adds a scroll and a treasure room, 3BC adds two scroll fragments, and 4BC adds three scroll fragments. These bonuses are cumulative and are not exclusive to that BC level. So in this example, compared to 0BC, the OS on 2BC will have a food shop, a bonus scroll, and an extra treasure room. On 4BC, it will have all of those things and five scroll fragments. This map is incredibly useful because it can help plan out a route so you can maximize the amount of scroll fragments and scrolls of power that you find, as well as knowing where the food shops and other bonuses are. The sections for fighting the bosses show how many scroll fragments they'll drop. For example, you can see that fighting Conjunctivius instead of Concierge will have a better effect on your scroll count since she drops 5 fragments to the Concierge's 3, just as fighting the Timekeeper will grant you less scroll fragments than if you fight the Giant. As a final big note here, while this biome map is incredibly useful and I love it to pieces, if you're avoiding 5BC spoilers then please don't scroll down past the last tier of the levels. Stop when you can see the Infested Shipwreck, Derelict Distillery, and the High Peak Castle. Below those, the map has the names and images of 5BC spoilers, so if you're avoiding those, please be careful. This next section is going to be a bit long since it details a convoluted side quest in 3BC that I refer to as the Acceptance Route. The gist is that if you get three Moonflower Keys in three specific levels in order, then you can unlock a trio of doors in High Peak Castle that will open a treasure room that has the Acceptance Mutation. This mutation is a little niche, but the benefit of doing the side quest is that once you get that mutation and clear the castle, those bonus doors will always be open. This will allow you to get extra gear and money during your future trips to the castle, so I personally think it's worth it since you may be going there a lot in most of your runs. This side quest is also necessary if you want to unlock every blueprint in the game. 
This route's a little complicated, so stay with me here. Here's how you get the keys that you need. In the Promenade of the Condemned, there are three Gardener's Keys. You'll need all the runes to get these. One is found at the top of a tower, one is buried underground, and another is found by stomping a specific flower three times. You'll want to get all of the keys and then take them with you to the ramparts. This goes against my earlier advice about never skipping the prison depths or corrupted prison, but there's no path from the prison depths to the ramparts, so it's necessary to skip that extra biome one time for this route. Somewhere in the ramparts, you'll find a secret area in a wall or in a ceiling that has a locked door and a white flower behind it. This is a Moonflower key. Unlock the door with one of your red gardener keys, grab the white Moonflower key, and then after clearing the level, take the 3 BC door to the Conjunctivius fight. Do not go fight the Concierge or you won't be able to get all three Moonflower keys. After fighting Conjunct, take the Graveyard Path. In the underground crypt section, you'll find another secret area just like you did in the ramparts. Unlock the door and get the Moonflower key here. The next level you'll need to go to is the Forgotten Sepulchre, so take that exit from the graveyard and keep your eyes peeled for another secret area with the third and final Moonflower key. This level is the trickiest to find the key in since it gets dark really quickly and your light sources are limited. Try to scan all of the walls and ceilings as you make your way through the area for the secret passage instead of having to backtrack for it. When you see it, unlock the last door, finally get the third Moonflower key, and then make your way to High Peak Castle. Once you get there, you'll need to explore the whole map, including the bonus chess rooms that are either under a breakable floor or up through the spider room corridors. At some point, you'll see a secret in the wall that you can go through and you'll see three locked doors. This secret area does not show up on the map, so you'll need to search as you go. Use your Moonflower keys to unlock the doors, get the items in the acceptance blueprint, and then clear the level. Now those doors in that area will always be unlocked during your future runs, and you'll also have a pretty niche and case-specific mutation. Congratulations on completing the most obtuse and unnecessarily and needlessly long puzzle in the entirety of Dead Cells. This may come as a surprise, but when you beat 3 BC, you'll unlock 4 BC. This is when things start to get really spicy. Once you're comfortable with clearing 3 BC and have put enough cells into the plus plus quality, maybe even some of the S quality of the forge, it's time to move up to 4 BC. You'll get triple the cells on this difficulty, so you'll be flush with cells as you play. Default item quality increases again, and you can finally max out the S forge at 100%. If you're keeping count, this is the third time I've broken my promise about not talking about the forge. I'm sorry, but it's for your own good. So those are some good things. Unfortunately, I have some pretty terrible news for you. All of the flash refills are broken in 4 BC. Every single one. And there are no flash recharges between levels. The only way you can get flash charges back is to either buy them at food shops or to use the tainted flask mutation. In addition to not having any flash refills, enemies teleport now. Isn't that great? Actually, teleporting enemies are great. So hear me out. You've already met plenty of enemies like elites and dark trackers that will teleport to you regardless of what BC you're playing on. Now, most other enemies will too. This sounds like it might be a nightmare, but you can actually use this mechanic to your advantage. Take a moment to think back when you had a tough mob or a group of enemies in the way of your critical path where you couldn't progress without fighting them. Starting in 4 BC, you can aggro enemies by either being in their line of sight, attacking them, or by attaching your homunculus rune to them. This will trigger an animation where you'll see a red outline of the enemy near you and then they'll teleport. Enemies will teleport behind you if there's space for them so you can manipulate where the enemies will be just by changing the direction that you're facing. Also, on 4 BC, enemies will only teleport one at a time so you can aggro a bunch of enemies and then pick them off one by one from a ledge or a safe spot. This may take some time to get used to, but I encourage you to purposely experiment with how certain enemies teleport and how to use this to your advantage. There are enemies that will not teleport though, like Arbiters and Inquisitors, so they can remain incredibly annoying and happily pick you off while other enemies are zipping around the map to try to get you. In my opinion, learning which enemies teleport and how they do so is an integral part of learning how to play 4BC. Overall, teleporting enemies is the biggest change with 4BC and is where most of that aforementioned spice comes from. Aside from that, it's pretty much business as usual like the other difficulty increases. Enemies have even more HP and hit even harder, and your overall gear level becomes even more important. You theoretically could play 4BC with plus or plus plus level gear, but why would you want to do that to yourself when you can just invest a bunch of cells into the... Uh, I mean... 
You know where I'm going with this. At this point, you've made it through a lot. You've gotten four boss cells, are playing on the penultimate difficulty, and are likely facing some of the biggest challenges you've seen in Dead Cells yet. As you have been all along, continue to experiment with what works best for you, especially now that you've seen that the basic game mechanics are starting to change. Maybe you've mostly played tactics, but now you're finding that harder hitting survival weapons are more fitting for killing teleporting enemies. Perhaps it's time to camp out with some turrets in the support mutation so you can just watch enemies teleport single file into your carefully curated death trap. Or maybe, just maybe, you start to main hand hook and realize that when you made your 0BC tutorial video, you were totally wrong when you wrote a mean joke about it and you actually like it now. Whatever you're experiencing on 4BC, make sure you don't lose your beginner's mind even though you've made it seriously far and have likely cemented your playing styles and your preferences. You will continue to have brutal losses just as you will also continue to find unexpected and exciting ways to win. Approaching Dead Cells' difficulty with curiosity rather than fear can make a huge difference in both getting to 4BC and in overcoming the obstacles within. Breathe deep and journey on, everyone. Now that we've gone through the ins and outs of 2, 3, and 4BC, I want to talk about some miscellaneous tips and strategies. Some of these are pretty general and others are more fine-tuned and specific, but I found these all to be helpful both in becoming a better player and in having more successful runs. My first and most basic piece of advice, which may be the hardest to follow, is stop slamming. I know it feels good and I do it all the time myself, but you never know what you'll be getting into if you slam down into unfamiliar territory. You could hit a poison pool and reset your kill streak, drop right down into a bunch of spikes, or smash down on an unsuspecting elite that could ruin your momentum and your run. If you've cleared the map and you know where you're going, then slam away to your heart's content, but otherwise I advise descending with caution. On the other end of this, you may want to start taking advantage of the invincibility frames that Dead Cells gives you when picking up certain items. Whenever you open a door or pick up a scroll fragment, you'll get a brief period of invincibility, and you'll get more iframes if you get a scroll or if you open a challenge rift. This brief pause can really make the difference if you're about to get rocked by a stray projectile or trampled by a rampaging elite. Whenever you go into a door that goes into a side area of a level, the time outside of that door pauses and will resume when you go back. Be super careful when traveling between layers of levels since an angry enemy or exploding bomb may be waiting for you right where you left it when you return. This next one may sound pretty fundamental, but if you haven't been killing everything in every biome, then now is the time to start. There are a handful of reasons for this, but I recommend doing it primarily for practice and resources. Every enemy drops gold, and occasionally enemies will drop a random item, which you can either add to your build or recycle. As a general rule, you should always kill enemies that are more annoying or hazardous before clearing out less aggressive and localized mobs. For example, kill Inquisitors before other mobs so they're not targeting you with your spells while you're trying to make your way through a batch of enemies. By seeking out all of the enemies in a level, you'll be covering more ground so you'll have a better chance of finding hidden food and challenge rifts. Full clears will also help you get some reps in against every mob and every level, so the next time you go through the slumbering sanctuary, you'll be parrying and destroying golems with ease. Killing everything will also ensure that you don't miss a start enemy who will always drop some kind of special item or scroll. As a side note, I recently started a fresh save file to get myself mentally prepared for this video, and I had two Philosopher's Stones drop in a really short period of time. Those are good vibes. Speaking of finding random items, I'm sure you've noticed by now that the walls and floors can have secrets in them which will contain either food or gold. You can make these secrets more noticeable by changing the visibility settings and adding a border around them in the accessibility menu. I also recommend checking off the Make Secret Areas Easier to See option so you can better see secret passageways in the walls. This may also help when you take the acceptance route. Adding the border to secrets will also help you see challenge rifts in the level. These rifts will open a portal to a chest that has a scroll, a necklace, and a bunch of cells. After opening the chest, you'll need to navigate a tricky platforming section before you can exit. Despite being dangerous, these rifts are an absolute gift. There's a 20% chance of one spawning in a level, and if you find one, then there's a good chance you'll also find one in another level during that same run. Always take these. Two things that I recommend doing to help you succeed when taking a challenge riff relates to being mindful of what can drop during a level. The first is food. If you find food that you don't need while you're playing, you should leave it out on the level. 
That way you'll have free healing available if you find a rift and take a few hits. It's best practice to not recycle food immediately and to wait until you're absolutely positive you don't need it before recycling it. Recycling unneeded food during a map cleanup is one of the last things I do after cleaning out the enemies. The second tip is to do the same thing with any amulets that you find. The affixes you should keep an eye out for in an amulet are an extra jump, which is good, or two extra jumps, which is very good. If you find a jump amulet that has stats that match your build, then I recommend always taking it. If the scrolls on the necklace are off color, like say you're running Brutality and see a jump amulet with only tactics and survival stats, you should leave it on the map in case you find a challenge rift. If you do find a rift, then you can swap necklaces before going in, so you'll have some extra jumps to help you with the platforming. There are a few specific platform generations in challenge rifts with long spike pits where having extra jumps are a godsend. Once you successfully make it through the rift, you can put your original amulet back on and then recycle the one with the extra jumps. Also, if you go into a rift and you get a necklace from the chest that has extra jumps but does not match the color of your build, you can put on that necklace and leave the one you were wearing behind. Don't recycle it. Go through the rift as normal and when you take the exit, your original necklace will be on the ground waiting for you. I know this is all a bit nitty gritty, but food conservation and amulet swapping can really help optimize parts of your run. The more parts of your run that you optimize, the better chance you have of finishing with a win. Since we're talking about more detailed strategies, this is a good time to mention something called scroll manipulation. Scroll manipulation is a way of tricking the game into possibly giving you an on-color dual scroll in the second biome of your run on 3 BC or higher. I originally learned about this from watching Modesto's showcase runs on YouTube, and I later found that Reddit user Forkexi has a written guide on scroll manip which explains what I saw Modesto do in great detail. I'll put a link in the description to both Modesto's channel and Forkexi's guide if you want to check them out. Scroll generation of Dead Cells is coded so that most of the dual scrolls you'll get are off-color. For example, if you have most of your scrolls in the Brutality stat, you'll often see Guardian scrolls, which will give you a stat in either Tactics or Survival instead. You have about a 90% chance of getting an off-color scroll like this, which means that there's only about a 10% chance of getting a dual stat scroll that does have your primary color. Even though this may sound counterintuitive, it's statistically better for you in the long run to take a double off-color amulet in the prisoner's quarters, so when you enter the next biome, you'll have two scrolls in your main stat and two scrolls in one of your off stats. So in practice, if you're running tactics, you'll want to enter the second biome, so the prom, sewers, arboretum, or the castle outskirts, with a stat count of 331 or 133 two points in tactics and two points in either brutality or survival. If you take this type of stat spread into the second biome, the odds of you getting an on-color dual scroll goes from about 10% to about 45%. I don't know about you, but I like those odds. Scroll generation is determined as the biome loads, so once you're in the level, you can find a better amulet. The caveat to this strategy is if you find a challenge rift in the prisoner's quarters, then you should just grab whatever amulet has the most points in your main stat, since that extra scroll from the rift makes it impossible to spread your stats evenly between two colors. I know this sounds counterintuitive and a little convoluted, but at higher BC levels, every extra scroll makes a difference, and this is one way to increase your chances of having an extra stat in your favor. If this is something that sounds interesting and you want to read the hard math behind it, definitely check out the guide. All right, so that wraps it up. Since we've made it all the way to the end, now's a good time to remind everyone that my usual final piece of advice still applies. Don't stop here. Watch other players' YouTube videos, check out streams from people like Abe Clancy or V.me, and interact with other members of the community to see what people have found to be helpful. I've been really fortunate to have had so many folks comment on my videos and share some of their thoughts and feedback, so there are some great tips from other players in there too. The journey through 4BC is challenging, but we don't have to do it alone. I love talking with viewers and reading comments, so if there's anything here that I can help clarify, or if you have any other questions, then feel free to leave a comment below and I'll do what I can to help out. Also, the comment section on this video is a good place to share your tips for higher BC levels with other players. My next full length video will be another big one, a 5BC tutorial, which will wrap up this four part series. I already have a ton of footage for that one, and I'm super eager to start writing the script since I spent so much time in 5 BC. Please look forward to that in the near future. In the meantime, as always, 
Thank you for watching and good luck out there.